Can someone confirm that you can see my screen? You can? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. And then I have to laser pointer. You can see my laser pointer as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Manfredi, and th today I'm going to talk to you. Like, uh, to, I'm going to tell you, let's say, a little story about how the brain works and how this helps us to remember things. Uh, what do I say? Little stories because the brain uh, is probably the thing that we know the least about in this world. <laughs> it's like such a small thing compared to the universe, but at the same time, it's uh, really poorly understood. And this uh, drove me to like try to make a contribution and understand how it works. But first, I want to present myself a bit uh, more officially. <laughs> so I am, uh, I am currently a PhD student, degree student in clinical neuroscience in the Dupre lab uh, in, in Oxford University. And I grew up in Sicily, which is a really sunny place, uh, which is uh, basically, if you're not sure where it is, it's like where this star is. And it's like this island in Italy. It's really wonderful, uh, good food and sunny place. Um, and this is also a picture from Sicily, by the way. And, at the, and basically, I grew up there and I attended high school. I attended the classic guitar academy. And I want to go back to Richard's point earlier about uh, uh, extracurricular activities in general. So I did my high school in Italy, right? And it's quite different from the system in the UK in the sense that in the UK, you spend specialize uh, in, in, in your GCSE and A-levels on three subjects that you think are gonna, you like the most. In Italy, this is quite different. So in Italy, you, you can't really choose what you study. And so uh, even if I knew I, I was probably gonna more, be more keen on medicine or engineering, uh, I had to study philosophy, Latin literature, English literature, art history, and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, I think those subjects really helped help shape me how the way I think. And this goes back to the extracurriculum point of view. Like, if you can use or like extracurricular activities to enrich yourself as a person, this will just help you uh, in your future career. And the reason why is, is coming up. So I studied math uh, a lot, and my favorite subject was the philosophy. Uh, nevertheless, I went to do, I went, I pursued my undergraduate in biomedical engineering at Imperial College in London uh, because uh, I, I was really passionate about applying maths and physics to actually uh, make a device that could solve, uh, I don't know, something related to health. Um, during my time at Imperial, I, I discovered the field of neuroscience and this made me go back to my high school years where I said, oh, Neuroscience is really close to philosophy. Uh, and for some of, if for those of you who don't know what philosophy is, philosophy is a subject that basically tries to describe the way we think. And it has been there since the uh, old Greek, so like 500 before Christ. And for me, neuroscience was basically the field that allowed me to uh, talk about philosophy, but from a, from a science point of view. So you can, I like to think of it as the philosophy, but in terms of talking verbally, like our normal language, the, la the language that we talk in neuroscience is math. And so now, uh, having said that, I want, this to, I want to make this a bit interactive. So I will ask you to go on slido.com again. If you were in the previous session, please log off and go to this one. So. Uh, is the code this time is sleep 2022 because this talk is about sleeping and memory. Uh, I'll give it a bit of time. Okay. Can everyone see this? I guess. Okay, just the first question is. What, what do you think is the function of the brain? Why do you, what, uh, why do you think uh, we have a brain? What did, does it allow us to do? And so on. 
So, uh, yeah, memory, school, uh, control, CNS. Some the person who wrote CNS probably knows knows it quite well. CNS stands for Central Nervous System, uh, making living things move. That's true. Survive. I really like this. Uh, survive emotion, control the body, uh, neurons. Oh, we we're getting really cool things. I am happy about it. Uh, hold memory. That's cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I really like survive because this is what I'm gonna talk about later. Reflexes, uh, yeah, super cool. I'm really happy. You you look really engaging. Okay, so let's pause for a bit and then we go to the next question. Okay, ready? Okay, now I'm asking. Some of you wrote me with memory, but I'm asking you, what do you think memory is useful for? Apart from the test that you had, you have in school, but <laughs> remember future events, survival again. I'm really happy about this word today. Growing as a person, that's fair. Uh, allow us to avoid danger, which is basically like survival, uh, development, uh, help us grow bonds through remembering things. Thinking, yeah, learn, yeah, I, I love these word clouds. Uh, you guys are really, really engaging. I love it. <laughs> uh, let me recite, try to read a few. Intelligence, gain experience, yes. Super, that's perfect. So now we're gonna move on to the last question, okay? Ready? Okay, now I'm gonna, this is the last topic, like in terms of like, of the, the talk I'm gonna go through, and this sleep. What do you think sleep is useful for? Rest, reset, reset is a cool word. Uh, consolidation, <laughs> yeah. Wow, <laughs> you probably read the title, nice. Uh, uh, gives us energy through uh, reboot the body, yeah. Functioning property, yes. Uh, rest and recover, amazing. Yeah, it's, I have to, someone wrote not really well studied and that's really true. And this is why I am spending so much time trying to understand what this sleep is, right? <laughs> okay, this is super interesting what you guys wrote. But, so, but now that you have like a bit of like ideas flowing through you, let's go back to the presentation, okay? Okay, you should now be able to see my PowerPoint. If not, please let me know. And also, by the way, if you have any questions, please put them. Uh, I don't know if you can put them in the chat or in the Slido, uh, whatever. And, and then I'm going to look through them. Okay, Okay. so let's start by the, by the definition. What is neuroscience? I, the definition that the Cambridge Dictionary gives is that uh, it's the scientific study. So it's like you discover something in a scientific way. Uh, of the nervous system and the brain. So someone wrote earlier central nervous system. So basically uh, we have a brain and then the brain is connected to our, our body through uh, neurons. And, and basically the main part that connects the brain to the, to the body is called uh, the spine, as you probably know. And basically these neurons in our body allow us to move. So as you as some of you correctly said, the brain is useful uh, for controlling movement. But in terms of uh, scientific study, right? Like neuroscience is a huge field because we really know pure, uh, we really know like really few things about the brain. So like there are a lot of subfields and these are, these are just few. Some people uh, will put more, some people will put different ones, but these are things, the ones that are related to today's talk. So there is like behavioral neuroscience where you're trying to understand what happens in the brain during behaviors. For example, I'm trying to look for food rather than like a boring thing and so on. Then there is molecular neuroscience where we're trying to understand what happens in terms of, in terms of molecular mechanisms, for example, in neurons or in the brain. Uh, then there is systems neuroscience, which is the one I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, so I'm going to leave it for last. Then there is uh, BCI, which stands for Brain Computer Interfaces. So if you, I don't know if you have seen this video, it's really cool. It's like a neural link, they implanted some electrodes in this uh, monkey and basically they 
with this electrode in the head, they could, the monkey was able to play Pong in a computer. So you use your brain to control a computer. This is the field of uh, brain computer interfaces. And in my undergrad, I did something related to this. But now I switch more towards uh, system neuroscience. So system neuroscience is, a, is probably the most matzy <laughs> of the neurosciences. And as a, what I put here is a, is called a network. So you, each one of these dots is like, let's say, could be a neuron. And we are trying to understand, in terms of maths, how these guys are connected. And how this can explain then behavior, OK? So let's try, let's, let's start from the baseline, OK? Let's try to understand how the brain works first. I find it a really good analogy for this is to compare the brain to a computer, okay? So the brain processes stimuli, so what, something that happens outside in the outside world, and then the, the brain understands what's going on, and then it gives you an answer. And you can think of this as, if, for example, if you try to open an, uh, a software in your computer, and then the computer will respond by actually opening it, right? You tell the computer, open, my emails and then the computer does it right second computers are made by tons of microchips uh, and basically each microchip allows the computer to be powerful in terms of like what it can do brains are instead made by billions of neurons which are these guys here so microchips and neurons we call them the fundamental units right of uh, of neurons for the brain and microchips for computer and finally, it's really important to remember that the brain is a really complex system. So it, you, you can split it, if you want, in different compartments. And each compartment has a role. And the same way, in the same way, you can think of it as, for example, the computers have a keyboard, a monitor, a, a mouse, the CPU itself, and so on. Okay, I hope this gives you like a uh, a uh, good base uh, to understand what the brain is and especially what neurons are. Remember, neurons are the basic uh, to, for the brain to function, okay? So I talked about brain compartment, but I wanted to give you an explanation of what this is. So this is a diagram of a human brain. And for example, in the blue, you have the somatosensory. What does it mean? That in this part of your, of your brain, you, you basically understand uh, the sensation of touch. In the red one, uh, in, this part of the, in the red part of the brain, you understand what you're seeing, visual. In the green one, you understand what you hear. So probably you're trying to understand my voice, and so on. Uh, and this is like for anything, like uh, olfactory, motor, then there is also planning for motor, like it's huge. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about one of the most interesting, at least for me, region in the brain, which is called the hippocampus. So, uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about mainly mice hippocampus because they, they are really well studied and this is what the main research is focused on. So if this, if you, this is the brain of a mouse and it's this one here and the hippocampus is this, this, uh, Basically, these black lines here is a really, really small area, but it has like critical roles. Okay. Uh, so to recap, brain has compartments that do specific things, and in one of the specific things is called the hippocampus, and this is what I work on. The hippocampus plays a huge role in memory, and I asked you earlier what is memory useful for, and some of them, some of you said survive, and I really like this because uh, basically. What memory allows us to do is to remember something, and basically then, when this something similar happens again in life, we can choose what to do based on what happened in the past. And it can, it can be as easy, for example, as I go to a pizza place and I ordered this pizza last week and I didn't like it, so next week I'm gonna order a new one. But if you look in terms of uh, survival uh, uh, and evolution, Lots of animals, for example, have to be uh, really uh, remember really well, for example, how their predators like sound like so that they could survive, right? And why, why is the hippocampus important? Is because the hippocampus, as you can think of it as, a, as the GPS of your memories. Uh, based inside this brain part, there is like a map of 
to the outside world. And when you are in some, uh, somewhere that you have been, the hippocampus will tell you, oh, you have been in this place, okay? So now I'm gonna try to give you an example of this. So let's try that, let's say that you want to go to buy Nutella at the supermarket, right? And there are a few steps to reach the Nutella compartment. So first you enter the supermarket, which is step one. This is like a mouse schematic, but let's say that mice can go to the supermarkets and buy Nutella. Then you have to turn left in step number two. In step number three, you pass by the vegetable stand. Step number four, you reach the corridor, and step number five, you find the Nutella, finally, okay? It's like a sequence, like a sequence of instructions. But let's, let's now talk about what happens during sleep, right? I, go, I went to buy the Nutella, straight afterwards, I go to sleep, okay? What happens during sleep is that you remember what you have just done. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that when you enter the supermarket to find the Nutella, you had like a camera, right? And then you go around and until you reach the Nutella. What happens during sleep is that you're basically kind of re-watching this video you made. And if you think of it that basically you're watching it all over again, at some point you're going to remember really well how to get to the Nutella, right? In the supermarket. So we call this replay. It's like if you replay a video you took and you want to memorize steps. Uh, and, and as I said before, like if you play it all, all over again, this will at some point, it's like you will remember it. This will create memory, right? And let's, uh, let's, now I want to explain in really simple terms how the neurons in the hippocampus are related to uh, uh, to a task, right? We talked about behavior, and our behavior is finding the Nutella in, in these five steps, right? So let's assume that now our, my, our mouse is moving around, right? Uh, and it takes him five seconds to find the Nutella, from the entrance to the stand of the Nutella. Uh, so where the animal enters the supermarket, the cell number one activates. What does it mean? It means that when this this cell, this neuron is activating, this is telling our brain, oh, you just entered the supermarket. You're a step number one, okay? Five seconds after, the animal reaches its goal. And in that place, the neuron number five, let's say, will activate. And again, say, following the same principle as before, this is telling the brain that we have reached our goal, the Nutella or sugar or pizza, whatever you want to imagine as a reward, okay? Again, we had, whenever we are in space, so like in, like for example, step one, step two, there is gonna tell, there's gonna be one neuron or like really few that will tell us where we are, okay? But let's, let's check now sleep. We have, uh, we have uh, seen that during sleep, you kind of replay this video of what of the steps that you've seen that, that you have done to reach your your goal uh, and so let's take our two cells again right since since you they are these cells were telling you where you were during your explorations your your uh, supermarket directions they will also activate what when you think about these things okay when you sleep then the thing is, if you remember earlier, we said it took five seconds for the animal to reach step one to step five. Whereas here, this is really important. In sleep, it only takes the animal 50 milliseconds on average to, to think this, all the steps between step number one and step number five. This is huge. You, you, you took like something that took five, five seconds of your life and in your brain, this can be replayed in 550 milliseconds, super quick. If, and this, you can think of it, for example, going back to the video example that I said, oh, you're in the supermarket, you go around taking a video, and when you go home, you rewatch it, right? When you're in sleep, you watch, the, you rewatch this video at fast forward, and you keep, you keep, you keep rewatching it at fast forward, and this, like, increases like, your memory capacity a lot. And there is a study here that I don't know if, if you want to read it, but it's very interesting. Uh, they, they showed that if you, if 
if this because these guys basically are almost synchronous, right? It takes almost no time for them to activate from one to step one to step five. If you basically uh, somehow uh, prevent these neurons to be synchronous, then you cannot remember anything. They basically show that, for example, one one mouse couldn't remember anything when the, the activity in sleep wasn't synchronous. So what does this what does this mean? It means that during sleep there is like the neurons really f replay whatever you learned super quickly, fast forward the video kind of thing. And if this speed is not high enough, then you don't remember things really well. OK, now I want to make you another analogy. As a new, so each neuron, you can think of it as a singer within a choir. OK, and during when the animal is awake, you can think that each neuron is like a soloist. Okay, you have like a solo within a choir that sings this part. And what's cool about soloists is that they have a specific voice, right? And and they are sparse. So when I, what do I mean by sparse? Sparse is, for example, when you have you have 100 possible options, but in the end you only get two. So what this means is like you have 100 possible people in the choir, but only one sings. Okay. And in sleep, you have basically the whole choir singing because we saw that these things happen almost simultaneously, super fast, right? So what's cool about being in a choir or listening to a choir is that when you hear a choir, first of all, it's just going to be much louder. It's like hundreds of people singing at the same time, right? And also, it's going to be a much richer sound. Like, there's going to be people who have, like, higher pitches, lower pitches. People are going to do harmony and so on. So the main difference between being awake and sleep, as far as memory is concerned, is that when you're awake, you have uh, basically specific things happening, like position one, position two, position three. Where in sleep, you have, like, the overall thing, like, like position one to position five is just one unique thing, which is like a unique memory. And what happens during sleep, again, I, wanna, I want to reiterate, is you keep repeating this pattern all over again. And after you sleep, uh, basically you will remember this sequence of steps really well. Now, don't take this slide really seriously. Like, as, as in, it's really serious, but it's super confusing because this is actually real, uh, real recordings that we do in my lab. I wanted to show you what we do, like something that I, I see every day, but I guess it, it will be confusing. But maybe some of you will be interested in to see what studying neuroscience means in practice. So here on the left, we have the animal being awake and on the right, we have the animal sleeping. OK, and each of these row. So don't worry about this part. OK, each of these row is going to be one neuron. OK. Like neuron is, for example, like a finger in the choir. And every time you see one of these tick, it means that the neuron was active over time. So the horizontal thing here is as time passes, OK? And if you check here, for example, the awake, like usually you only have really few or, or like single ones activated. For example, you take this snapshot in time, you're only going to see like two or three active. You take this snapshot in time, snapshot in time, and you're gonna have one, two maximum, right? Again, this is related to the fact that we saw earlier that during awake, you can think of neurons being like soloists in a choir. But now let's check sleep. Look at this snapshot in time. All the cells are are activated. Why right? you see a tick in every row, and this means that like the whole choir is singing, right? And same happens here, and same happens here, and so on. So what this is saying is that it's basically telling the animal, remember, remember, remember what you just did, because you're going to need it at some point later. And with this, I want to come to a summary of um, my presentation. I hope it wasn't uh, too complicated. I try to keep it as simple, simple as possible. Uh, but uh, so let's, let's do the summary first. Um, First, it's a really crucial point to know that the brain is really is a complex system. We really know a few things about it. And since it's so complex, different parts of it perform different things. And in particular, the hippocampus allow us to hold a map, like a GPS, of the environment around us 
which has to do with memories, for example. If I am here in my office now, my hippocampus will tell me, oh, you know this place, this is your office, okay? And then we saw that during, the during sleep, the hippocampus kind of replaced in a fast forward way what you learned just before sleeping, okay? And in the, towards the end, we saw that when you're awake, the hippocampus neurons activate in a sparse manner, right? like just few at the same time. Whereas during sleep, you have all of them activated together. So it's like the choir singing all together, really loud, really rich harmonies and so on. And this has been shown that promotes consolidation of memory in, uh, in, uh, in the animals. And with this, uh, my presentation comes to an end. I want to, I have to thank a few people, especially my supervisor, David, and all the members of the lab and the MRC for, spon uh, for sponsoring my project. I also have to thank Richard and the Trinity College for uh, giving me the chance to present this to you. It's my first presentation in Oxford, so it's quite, it's quite cool. And I want to thank, I really, really want to give a big thank to the members of the MCR of Trinity College. So for those of you who don't know, the MCR is uh, basically my common room as a PhD student. Uh, and the members are just amazing people. And because one of the most important things that you learn in, uh, during your studies is that sometimes the work is hard, right? Uh, you have to study a lot, so you're going to be really tired. But there is nothing best than like go to your friends, them, my friends in the MCR, and just have a, I don't know, and just laugh and talk about them, something. So uh, whatever you do in your life, uh, remember to that it's really, it's really important to have like good friends around you because they will support you through the good and through the bad things that will come in your university and future. And with this, I wanna, I'm gonna take questions. And yes, I, let's see. I'm gonna try to open Slido. Okay, there are a few questions. Thanks for asking. Uh, okay, maybe I'll do something. I'll stop sharing and I'll read the questions. Okay. Okay. Someone is saying, do we replace most of our memory in sleep? Uh, this is a super interesting question because this is uh, this is what my actual project is in the specific. So every time you saw one of these like choirs singing all together, most of the time this is replaying everything we just done. Other times not. So it's like we know for sure that around 40% of, of these guys is replaying what we have just learned. At the same time, we know that if those, those like choir singing is prevented by some techniques, uh, then the animal doesn't remember things well afterwards. This is a really cool question. Um, then do you know what happens inside the brain causing to wake up? in the middle of night, on the night suddenly. Uh, I don't know, this, this, is, this is probably like, uh, it's a really complex uh, experience. Uh, what I probably guess is, is has to do with what you're dreaming. So dreaming is another huge field in neuroscience. And maybe if, if there is something which is impacting you a lot, for example, a really like traumatic uh, dream or like really intense dream, then you kind of wake up. Uh, I guess, uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if this has to do. Probably, I don't, I don't think this has to do with memory and replay, as far as I'm concerned. Why do we sometimes alter our memories when asleep? I'm not sure what this means. Probably, I'm gonna assume you mean uh, that that they change, maybe. Uh, and and like we don't remember things well, so this is this is a hard question because a uh, passage of time plays a huge role. As you probably know, if you study something yesterday for today's test, you really remember it well. If you study something last year for like last year's test, it's something else. You probably won't remember it. And so there is this huge pass passing of time which plays a role. And uh, and then at the same time, 
the way the neurons encode. So the way each, each, it's like, okay, let's go back to the example of the singers in the choir. Uh, each, each neuron is a singer, right? Neurons are super cool because it's like, it's like a, as if the singer during his performance changes its voice. It's a comp he, comp he starts sounding like a different person. So this also plays a role in affecting our memories. Uh, okay, another question. Does this have any correlation to lucid dreaming? Uh, I don't think so, because uh, when it comes especially to humans, uh, dreaming is a much more complex pattern than this. And then there are really uh, ugly cognitive things, which I think are not really explored yet. Uh, does this relate to sleepwalking? Uh, I don't think so either, because uh, uh, basically sleepwalking is also a consequence of highly cognitive functions that basically allow your your body to uh, keep on dreaming so yeah you kind of your brain is like kind of in the state but at the same time it it targets your motor part in your brain and tells it to work but this has nothing to do with the memories themselves okay there are lots of questions i'm gonna randomly pick some <laughs> How can the research that you just presented be used in real life? For example, with the development of technology that we could use to record memories to be watched later. Okay, this is an interesting question. So I'm gonna rephrase it. Uh, basically the question is, okay, now you know that you can, during sleep, you can, the animals is like uh, replaying all these things, but what do we do about it? So it's really, it, the applications are multiple. For example, first, in terms of uh, in terms of real life, there are two main roads you can take. One, which is the one I'm pursuing, is uh, uh, that uh, basically you want to discover how these things work. And this is just basically pure science and discovery. Uh, the other road is to, up, to find a technology, and this is more related to what I did in my undergrad in engineering, uh, or something called clinical neuroscience. There are some people, for example, in my lab that look at the hippocampus, and they, sh they, are, they found that, for example, this has a huge uh, impact uh, to, uh, for example, addiction. So if you if you can imagine that you are able to crack down somehow how the addiction works in your brain. So because addiction sometimes is just out of your control, right? You, you just want to get up. You're just going to abuse more and more without you being, control, in being in control of it. And if we crack down what this is, then we can uh, basically shut down whenever your brain is, is trying to basically have a, an episode of being addicted again. So this will be a, an application, I would say, a very interesting one. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to do the last two questions. Richard, what do you say? Yeah, it, it's difficult, isn't it? Because there's, there's some great questions here. Yeah, and you've yeah. really, you've really okay, gone through them do, well. Let's do the top three. Uh, I give you guys like... I'm just having a look at them as well, Mon Freddy. I, I, <laughs> whichever you think are the most interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm going to let the, the guys vote. So you guys can like the questions, okay? I'm going to give you a few seconds to vote for the ones you want me to answer. I'll, as long as I have not answered it already. Okay, let's stop this. Okay, because <laughs> the likes are keeping reading. Okay, this first one, second one, and okay, perfect. I have my three. Okay, uh, third place <laughs> is uh, the question is why do we usually forget our dreams? Ah, this, but this I already kind of answered it already. Why do we usually forget things when, after we wake up? Um, but this is a bit different. Uh, 
So this question is asking that most of the times, uh, then after we wake up, including me, I completely forget my dreams. Like I, I can't remember them at all. And uh, this, I think, this is like this is like there is like lots of people looking into this. But for, rather than at the neuroscience point of view, the main research into this is from a psychology point of view. So. Uh, Lots of people as, uh, are probably as, uh, uh, studying why did you dream that in terms of like what happened to you in life that made you dream that. And, and then it, say, psychologists are trying, for example, to understand whether you forgot it because it's something you want to forget. I saw, for example, something bad or you forgot it because you prioritize giving attention to other things. And... I, I, I don't I don't know if this is is a universal for everyone. I think this is a really subjective thing. Uh, for example, I have I can remember things that happened with me and my friends like four years ago and give you details about these things, but I cannot remember at all my dreams. So it's it's not that like if you have a good memory, it will it will emphasize the way you remember dreams. Um, but like probably if you're interested into this, you can look at people in. Uh, psychology department of the research on dreaming. Uh, okay, then second question. I uh, know this was, uh, why, do we dream? why do we dream about things that have not happened to us? Okay, this is a, this is a cool question. As far as I, as I, I can see it, is basically there are lots of regions in your brain that you, something happens to you. Let's say that you, you got a coffee today and a bit of time later in the day you receive uh, i don't know a text from your friend from undergrad or like not for me undergrad so from uh, from middle school okay <laughs> and basically lots of places in your brain are gonna try to connect these two events okay and and basically the connection is mainly non-logical right because uh, what what tends to Happen then in dreams is, for example, that you had coffee with your undergrad, with your uh, middle school friend, and this hasn't, hasn't happened to you, but it's because your brain has, has seen two things, like coffee, high school friends. Maybe with your high school friends you used to take a lot of coffee before, and then, and then like your 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 brain joined these dots and makes uh, and makes this kind of episode when you sleep where you're dreaming of having coffee with your friend, even if this didn't happen. This is a really cool field um, um, because you can, the, like, for example, when it happens to me about sleep, I, I think that the most unlogical things happen to me. For example, my friends from Italy being here and my friends from here being in Italy. You know, it's like this kind of joining of, of dots that really does uh, not exist. <laughs> Uh, but then, okay, so then the last question is, that what is deja vu and how does it work? Okay, this is, this is a really interesting question too. So deja vu is basically when uh, you, let's say you're, you're having your normal day life, right? And at some point you see something and, you, and you're like, oh, like I've just, I think I've lived this this thing already. Uh, is uh, I don't I don't think that scientifically it can be assessed like uh, and proven that this is actually true. Like as in you you probably have not lived a parallel life where this has happened or you kind of predicted it. What I think happens in your brain is that the way memory works is like. Uh, I'm gonna try to think of an example which is really simple. Uh, it's like, okay, let's say that um, you're delivering the, uh, delivering the mail, right, to someone's house, and you do the same road every day, every day, every day, when you have to come to my house. Uh, at some point, if you don't do this road anymore, then you will forget where I live, right? Memory works like this. You're trying to send a message across neuron, and the more the more this information, the more these letters travel the same road, then the better you will remember it. And I think when you have a deja vu, what happens is that 
you probably see a person and leave a, something like, for example, an experience that can be, for example, a movie or like coffee or pizza, or whatever. And so basically what happens in this kind of roads that deliver the mail, I said, is kind of, you kind of relive the same thing. Uh, for example, you're driving and you say, oh, I think I've been in this road, uh, but you probably have not. And this, this is happening in the brain. So it's telling you, oh, I've already lived this thing. But I think scientifically, what I can tell you is probably that you have been in a similar situation with maybe the similar context. So like people and everything and then your brain is good at telling you oh like you're you're you have been in a similar situation before uh, but it's really I, I have to be there sometimes it's it's really cool when you actually feel like oh like i actually thought that this uh like i had a huge deja vu uh, it happens to me a few times it's cool <laughs> but I, I scientifically unfortunately i don't think this is uh proven or can be proven uh and yeah with this uh my presentation comes to an end it was I, I had lots of fun especially with the questions i hope it was as clear as possible as far as it can be knowing that we like even me or like people who work in neuroscience for years know so poor about the brain <laughs> because it's so difficult so i hope you got you're gonna go home with some ideas about oh wow like the brain the brain is really cool and we really know nothing about it <laughs> and and take home message if you have a test tomorrow sleep well <laughs> because you're gonna remember the things you study well <laughs> on freddie thank you so much very much uh thank you so much rather um for that uh Absolutely fascinating. Well, <laughs> there are a couple of questions that have just popped in very late to Slido. So okay. maybe if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of moments just to reply to those textually after the call, if that's OK. There's one that's come in, says, please answer this. It's late. But uh, yeah, that, if, if you can, just a few, a few line, uh, a couple of lines of response, that would be brilliant. But uh, thank you so much uh, for yeah. some great questions from students. Um, and thank you most of all to Manfredi for giving up your time and explaining, I think, so clearly something that we know Hopefully. so little about <laughs> go on uh, okay thanks so do you want me to answer here and people can leave in the meanwhile or by text uh i don't know if i can reply to those uh, things on okay Slido. uh so guys then. i think i think if like you're free to go if the people who ask the question want to stay want to stick want to stick for like the next five or uh, ten minutes so i'm gonna be is, around and, I know this question is late, but please answer this. Do memory temples work when you attach a memory to a routine to remember? And then I think uh, I think that's your your shift done tonight. <laughs> uh, where is this? Uh, uh, do, do, do. Uh, it's right at the bottom there. I know this question is late. Do memory temples okay, yeah. work yeah, when you uh, attach a memory to a routine I to remember? I yeah, uh, good question. I also quickly saw <laughs> that uh, someone said there was not math. There was not math, but if you, at the beginning, uh, if you remember, I said that math is the language that neuroscientists use to talk about the brain. Okay, it's like it's like, for example, I talk English to you guys, but we use math between neuroscientists. Uh, okay, then this question. Uh, I know this question is late, but please answer this. Okay, sure. <laughs> Do memory. Uh, uh, temples work when you attach a memory to a routine uh, to remember. Uh, okay, so let me try to understand this question. So I guess this is saying that if you have a routine and then uh, you try to attach a memory to this routine, then then you wanna. So this is like. You want to check whether if you attach a memory to a routine, then you can remember this memory better. Uh, I guess yeah, my answer would be yes, like you will remember it better. Because uh, it's, it starts from the same principle of, as, of what I said before. The way memory works at the molecular level, let's say, is that you have, you're delivering the mail. And for example, the mail can be your, your routine, right? Let's say your routine is... I wake up at eight, I'm quite lazy, and uh, between eight and nine, I do my breakfast, shower, and I get ready, okay? And 
in your uh, royal mail <laughs> track, you're basically deriver delivering this information. Wake up at eight, uh, showered after breakfast and so on. If you keep on like doing the same road for like to deliver this mail, at some point you're gonna remember this road really well, right? It's the same as we said before. On top of this, if you try to add something new to it, for example, uh, uh, let's say I need to remember to do this more, uh, for example, exercise, <laughs> and you stick it on top of like this normal routine, at the beginning you will probably forget it a few times, but once it establishes itself, uh, for example, in this really well-defined track of like route to deliver the mail, then it's going to become part of your routine, right? So I think this tempo's idea works, but not because it's like a technique that you can add something and then you will remember it better. For example, if you have a test and you say, oh, maybe if I link my subject test to this, I will remember it better. It's more about trying to replay it all over again and make it a routine. So I think it's the routine itself is what it's important for remembering things. And yes, yeah, someone is asking Taylor Swift opinion. I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I am, I am more of a classic rock person personally, uh, so I don't really like Taylor Swift. Uh, I should also uh, point out, man, Freddie, the number of thanks as well. Um, and uh, you know, it's beyond the call of duty, isn't it, to talk about Taylor Swift? But uh, yeah, I'm pleased you did respond to that. Um, hopefully, that satisfied the person who asked that question. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, Freddie, I'm going to call time there because you've you've given yeah. us a uh, lot of your time. Thank you so much. Um, no, it was you. my pleasure. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. It was and really thank you, cool students, for joining us. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Cheerio. Bye. Goodbye. Ciao.